Hello, welcome to the Wasting Time podcast. We're up to episode 46 now. I'm on the line with Nick. How's it going, Nick? I'm good, buddy. Yeah, yeah, not too bad at all. Not too bad at all. How are you? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. Weeks, weeks off to an all right start. Quite busy with work and stuff. They're tidying us over well um, at, the, at the LSE. Seems to be plenty to do, particularly with September coming. Yeah, likewise, likewise. Unfortunately, we're going through some... Um, some i guess cutbacks um so right that's that's a that's fun tough. time at the moment yeah yeah, so yeah. keep keeping my toes but um yeah i guess i guess from a lockdown point of view things are being lifted now and we're getting to see people at least and uh yeah absolutely enjoy some time out you've been out for a few beers already right yeah i've um so these past two weekends i've i've gone out separately and caught up with friends like on the saturday afternoon for a beer sort of you know drink outside and stuff and um it's crazy actually central london is not that busy and i think the the primary reason for that is obviously there's no tourists so you take the tourists out and then it, it makes a hell of a difference you know it's, it seemed like as well a lot of the, uh, you know, you've got a huge ma- amount of international workers working in London as well, you yeah, know, so yeah, yeah. It, there's a por- portion of portion of that as well. I know a, a lot of people who um, work for, for for the company I work for, I don't know if I can say it, yeah, I could say it, uh, work for BT, you know, international workers in London. You've said that before, so I think you're fine. Sorry, go on. Yeah, um, yeah broadband is available from other retailers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, I know a lot of those guys who like literally jumped on on flights back to you know where, you know their, their their countries across yeah. Europe and stuff, um, yeah, knowing knowing that everything was going to shut down. And, you know, I guess a lot of businesses um, down there and a lot of lines of work can still still operate. Um, you know, in an agile way from home and wherever in the world. I guess for you, yeah, yeah, yeah. So at this point, yeah. it's 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 noticeably quiet for what you would normally see. I mean, it's still. You know, relatively busy. It's capital city, but compared to normality, it's you, it's you really notice it. Well, and you got the, and you got the people who just aren't aren't ready yet. You know, I think yeah, there's a, there's a, a lot of people well. still in that. Yeah, there's a lot of people still in that category. And you know, my my wife's um, one of those people. You right. know, and I'm, you know, I'm, I, you know, I wasn't rushing back out to the pubs or anything. I haven't actually. I've been in a pub. Yeah, I was at a brewery on Friday, up in Amble, up the Northumberland coast, but. Um, you know that that looked beautiful by the way that um your your little trip on friday yeah it was nice um yeah good 80 odd mile cycle up the northumberland coast which beautiful country beautiful yeah coastline so that was nice and went with a couple of the boys as well just just to be able to just hang out hang out like like we used to was nice but yeah um you know i came back came back on saturday a bit sore and stiff but you know kind of dropped the idea to lucy that you know you know, do you fancy going out for a meal next week? Maybe have a date night because you know we've literally been on top of each other for of for weeks with us both working from home, and it's like, like, yeah, it doesn't. I don't think it does us any good. But well, I suppose it. it yeah, there's there's two sides to it, but yeah, just kind of plant the seed. Is potentially going for a meal or something, and she's like, mm, not, not too quite, sure. Not quite yet. there yet. Yeah, but you know she's looking after for elderly elderly parents as well, so she worries worries about anything, yeah. anything you know being passed on there. But she said she'd be keen if it's outside. So okay, um, so yeah, we're gonna have a look at maybe booking something outdoors um, for a, for a start. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, like 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 you, it's 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 relatively quiet up here, and although I haven't been in many places in in Newcastle. Um, you know, just go driving around and passing places. Nowhere, nowhere's kind of heaving, and still a lot of the pubs up here are, are staying closed as well. Um, yeah. You know, I think town in in the city and some of the bigger places are, are going for it, but um, I get the sense that smaller small places are kind of holding back. And I, I guess it's from maybe from a from a profit perspective. You know, is it be you know these smaller places can they actually turn a profit with with all the guidelines that uh, that are in place, you know. Uh, but anyway, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how the next. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how it shapes. Yeah, is things supposed to change again at the end of the month. So some more restrictions being lifted or being cited to be lifted at the end of the month. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously all being well, but yeah, we'll see what happens. 
Yeah, what about, what about the music world, man? Is there anything you've been getting into recently? Well, I feel like there's only really one one new release we should talk about, really. Which is? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't believe I, I was being genuine when I said which is. Yeah. Um, do, you, yeah do you want to start on that one? Yeah. So um, I, I guess we, we went through the archives a little bit over the last few weeks in lockdown and um, came across uh, our... Well, mine and Chris's old band's EP. Would we call? Do we call it an EP? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd say so. Called called the Tap and Manzel, although it <laughs> it was never called the Tap and Manzel. But Chris decided to give it a name so he could um, get it up on um, on Spotify, and probably to tell people to search for the album title instead of the band title. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because <laughs> um, you might you may have seen on our social media when we shared this, but. But our band was called First Time, which uh, I think I think never we, liked. We, no, even at the time, we used to cringe when we tell people. I don't mind it so much, man. Like, I don't mind it that much. Oh, really? What is that? I mean, over- it's not it's not great, but I don't I don't don't have as many issues with it as you. No, I suppose like you know if 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 you compare it to like a name like Simple Plan, for example, it's no worse than that. And when you think of Simple Plan, like. You don't think, oh shit, name, do you? Like, I mean, I know lots of no. people think shit music, but um, they wouldn't be down on the <laughs> name per se. <laughs> yeah, we've not got quite the, the backing of Simple Plan, though. No, no, we did, didn't have but quite the career may, they did. But I guess this is our opportunity, so um, yeah. I guess we'd really appreciate it if people went and give it a listen and um, give us uh, their thoughts. And uh, yeah, it'd be nice to get like a few few plays on there and i mean i've just really enjoyed um d- digging it out and listening again and yeah going it's... through the whole nostalgia of it all i mean I, and it's funny isn't it i mean this is the case for anyone who's in a band at any stage like it's it, it's hard to be object i mean when 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 time's passed it's easier to be objective and say how good you honestly think it is i mean like you see this with bands currently like that you know they'll put out a new album they'll think it's the best thing they've ever done then a few years go by and then they can look at it a bit more um mm. a bit more honestly and a bit you know take it look at it from from a distance 14 years on was it 14 <laughs> years we have so that's, and and i think uh, yeah i think it's it's held up it's held up pretty well which is why i wanted to have it out i mean i don't think it's amazing but i think it's good and i'm, I'm still proud of it what about you yeah, yeah, I think there's some some solid songs on it. Um, re- I've really enjoyed listening to them. I actually was playing it um, in the house, and the wife was like, "Oh, who's that you listen to?" I was like, oh, it's, "You know, it's my old band." She, she was just like, "It's she, she literally didn't believe it." I was like, that's <laughs> "Really? That's really rude." Um, uh, uh, yeah, no, I, I've really enjoyed digging it, digging out again. So, yeah, go give it a listen. Um, search for the band first time or the album record EP, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's the Tap and Manzel with a Z um, on Spotify, Apple Music, anywhere else, Chris? Uh, well, just just wherever you get your music should be everywhere. Um, Is it? Yeah, and that's Manzel spelled M-A-N-Z-I-L. Just type first time Manzel and you find it. Um, but yeah, we'd love to know what people think of it Like all these years later because we never had it out at the time, annoyingly. Yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> we had a label, if you remember, of, if you remember Nick, that was going to put it out, and then it just all fell through. Um, but yeah, that's that, and um, we'd appreciate anyone who checks it out. Um, yeah. What about any 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 anything else that's come out that that's caught your ear? Um, just trying to think now. Listen to that new MXPX track. Oh yeah, what'd you think of that? It was yeah, it's all right. I you know it's not. Not exciting me too much. No. Um, yeah, I mean, the uh, I love the fact that they've been putting out quite a lot of music, you know, fairly consistently over the last few years, particularly this year. And like the odd songs been pretty decent, but just from what I expect from them at their best, a lot of this, including this new one, just falls a little flat for me. Yeah. It's just yeah. a bit like, oh, let's write a song and it's just doesn't have much to it, you know. I suppose we we chatted about this new the uh, new new fan glory record in the last last episode. Yeah, right? we covered that on the last one because that yeah. was a few weeks ago now. Yeah, 
Um, has, has that stayed with you much? Um, yeah, yeah, a little bit. Um, put it on the head, headphones and in the car a little bit. Still enjoying it. Yeah, um, yeah, I think it's really good. What about you? Uh, yeah, like no, nothing's excited me um, as much as as that did since. Um, yeah, a couple of. Th- things here and there like neck deep have got an album out on friday so i've been listening to each song they've been putting out um, oh yeah i heard that this morning like it's quite a slow like a slow tempo so yeah like all all of like, uh, they've put out like four i think is it f- no five from the album they've right. all been they've all been like that that's the kind of sound they're going yeah for. they definitely yeah they definitely said they've gone in a new direction didn't they but yeah uh, um i've only heard that one actually i need to go and go and um go and check that out yeah, it's it's um, it's it's worth checking out. My favorite one is Fool. Track two is my favorite one so far. Okay, but yeah, the whole thing's out this week. Be interesting to see, you know, with the kind of slow tempo stuff, how that how that um, you know reflects with their with their fan base and um, you know live shows when when they happen. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. If you've got see if they yeah. if they, they 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 hold it up i i think they they they're kind of aiming for the mainstream a little bit more and like and be interesting to see if they make any dents in that at all mm. Mm. okay cool anything else going on no i think i think that's really those are the main things from now i think maybe we can get into today's today's interview i guess sure do you want to yeah wanna go on? yeah sure so today we had the pleasure of talking to darren pfeiffer um who's probably most famous for being the long-term drummer of Goldfinger, which he, he was he was there at the start for, um, which he started with John Feldman, and then kind of had a up-and-down relationship with the band, and I think he ultimately left in 2015, so or 2016, so not too long ago. But, uh, you know, he's a busy guy because he runs a record label called High 4 Records, um, has his own show on Adobe Radio called the Dangerous Darren Show, and he's does, and his, he, does his punk rock karaoke. Oh yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. One of the first things we talk about. So yeah, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty amazing. Um, you'll hear in a minute him go into go into it about that, uh, which sounds super cool. Yeah, just a really active guy in the punk rock music scene, and um, yeah. So with that said, let's get into it. Okay, hey Nick, hey Chris. <laughs> Hey man, so I guess we'll get hey. we'll get get straight into it, man. If that's all right with you, we don't want to keep too much of your time. So yeah, uh, go for it. Let's jump in. Yeah, so I, I guess we were supposed to be speaking last week, but you were pretty pretty tied up with some stuff. Uh, I, I guess what 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 you've been working on right now? What's 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 going on with you? I got a few projects on the go. I you know play in a band called Punk Rock Karaoke with a bunch of these punk rock legends like Greg Hudson, and Eric Melvin, and it was Steve Stuttle until he passed away. Now we got Randy Bradbury from Pennywise and Stan Lee from the Dickies and all. And it's just a fun, really fun gig where we go around the world, really, and play these shows. We got about 75, 80 songs, and people jump up and sing, and sometimes it's epic and sometimes it's not so epic. But either way, it's still super fun. The best part about this band is I've known these guys <clears throat> for a long time, and they're super chill, and we don't have a singer. That's the best part of the band. We don't have a singer. <laughs> but when we show up to rehearsal, everyone's on time. And, and when we show up to fly somewhere, everyone's on time. And there's no ego. There's no there's no drama. It's it's the best best band. One of, one of the funnest bands I've ever been in in my life. So you actually t- tour with it. I didn't realize you actually kind of travel around. I thought it was kind of a local a local deal. No, no, no. We play, uh, we've been to Costa Rica. We've been to Panama. We've been to Puerto Rico, all over Canada and the U.S., U.K., so who who goes who goes mad for for punk rock karaoke in terms of a nation? Who's who's gone the craziest for it? God, you know we do the flogging Molly salty dog tour every year, and we go down to the Bahamas and the Florida Keys, and we've been doing it for the last five years. And those people on the boat, man, I don't know if it's the mix of being trapped and nowhere to go, or the alcohol, or or both, but they just go mental. It, it, it's it's great. So, so what's what's that kind of been? Um, I mean, how does that work out at the moment? I mean, is that still are you still trying to do things with those guys kind of virtually, or is that kind of grinded to a halt a little bit at the moment? Well, the shows obviously have grinded a halt for just about everybody yeah, in the world. Course. So we've been putting together these really fun videos where we film ourselves playing the song, and then we send it to we try to send it to as many high profile singers as possible. Last week we had Stephen uh, Edgerton from 
Stefan Edgerton from Descendants jump nice. on and sing uh, Love Song by the Dam this week. Uh, Greg's daughter, Violet, is singing uh, Bikeage. Well, that was just released this morning. So it, we're getting great response. The fans are loving it. It keeps us busy. It keeps us active. It keeps us relevant. It keeps us, you know, gives yeah. us something to do. So besides, besides that, I mean, I've been um, writing my own songs. I've been thinking about doing an, another solo record. Uh, I've been playing drums on people's records. Uh, people will send me um, a, down, a demo of a song and say, what do you think of this? And I'll be like, that sounds awesome. Let's let's record it. So I'll find a. I have a studio, and if I and if my studio doesn't isn't isn't work, then I'll I'll go to a friend's studio and jump on the drums and record a, a track and send it over. And sometimes you get paid, and and sometimes you don't. But again, it's just a matter of staying sharp, staying on your instrument, and and trying to stay sane because, you know, what's going on right now with with COVID, especially in America, where we're way behind the times. To mm. other countries like the UK and the rest of Europe and so South what, Korea and Australia, like it's, we, we, you have to do whatever it takes to st stay sane and stay, yeah, um, stay busy until the dust settles from this mess. I was talking to a guy at work today, and it was like, you know, men the whole mental health side that comes off the back of um, what's happening right now. It really kind of brings brings that to light a little bit more. And I think, I guess, a lot of people who maybe haven't suffered from mental health or, you know, don't have an understanding. It's really brought a bit more awareness around kind of, kind of that, that subject, I guess, really with, with, I guess, people feeling. You're absolutely, sorts. you're absolutely right. Because we've seen a rise in depression. We've seen a rise in suicides. We've seen a rise in domestic violence. We've seen a rise in child abuse and in this, not only this country, but other places around the world. And it's because people are cooped up with each other and people are, are, uh, starting to come undone and it, anything you can do to mitigate some of that stress or, or relieve some of that stress, whether it's working out or, or, uh, yeah. just going on a long drive with yourself. I've done that before. I've got on the car and I've driven down to San Diego, just right. a two hour drive. And it just clears your head. And then you drive back yeah. and you feel like you just, you feel like a million bucks. So, so yeah, go and just find ways to, to, to vent your frustration and vent your anger and this is unprecedented times none of us have gone through this before we we've never the world hasn't seen something like this in 100 years so we don't have anything to fall back on to as far as devices so so, so what's yeah. what's the deal in la at the moment then in terms of like your where you are as a state and the guidance that's that that, that you kind of you're being being given at the moment where where are you at with that well, there's a phase two opening, and I do believe there are restaurants and bars that are open. You can't go inside. The only way it works is if you're dining outside, which is great because when you're close quarters inside of a restaurant or a bar, that's when you're more likely to, to pick up something, even if you're wearing a mask because people are touching shit. But, uh, yeah, it's outside dining, outside drinking. Movie theaters are still shut down. Uh, concerts, venues are obviously still shut down. No gatherings of more than 10 people. Um, social distancing. In California, it's a little different than the rest of the world, like especially Florida and parts of Texas. And I'm not going to bag on Florida and Texas, even though I love doing that. <laughs> it just seems like some of the people in, in those states and Arizona are not taking this seriously. There's a lot of people... A lot of videos right now yeah, on, on we've seen that. about people going crazy. They call them Karens. Or <laughs> going crazy because they don't feel they should wear a mask. Or they just they, they say, I'm an American, constitution this, constitution that. And it's, and people are, are these poor mental. people at bars and restaurants and Walmarts and Costco's are having to become makeshift police officers and tell these people, no, you can't come in because – this is our new mandate and, and it's just crazy. You don't see that that much in other parts of the world. And it just, it's just embarrassing. As an American, it's embarrassing. It's Trump's America, isn't it? At the end of the day. It is. Know, it, like, it's, it's sad. I hate it. I, I enjoy your comments on Trump's America, of, you know, in your intros on of the dangerous Darren shows. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, man. I mean, I'm very opinionated. Um, for all the people listening, wherever they may be listening around the world, just exercise common sense. Don't be a dick. Exercise common sense. Wear a mask. Social distance. <laughs> and don't think that scientists and doctors are out to get you or have some sort of political agenda. 
I got in an argument the other day with someone at, uh, at, a, at a bar. I was visiting a friend, and we were social distancing and wearing masks and being 10 feet apart. And some guy chimed in, and I was like, you think that doctors went to school for – and scientists and health experts went to the school for eight years, 10 years to get their position way high up in the health field just to wait for a global pandemic so they can spring their diabolical political scheme against you? It, my sister works for the CDC. My sister, Heidi, she works for the CDC in Atlanta. And she went to school for eight years. And she got her job, and it's a great job. And, and she's just dumbfounded that people look at scientists and go, I don't, I don't believe you. I think it's fake. I think you're trying to control me. And if there's a vaccine, I'm not taking it. And, and that didn't happen 50 years ago. That didn't happen when polio or smallpox or rubella yeah, was yeah. a problem. It, scientists dove in. They figured it out. They said, we're going to give you a shot, and then you don't have to ever worry about rubella. No one said back then, oh, you're trying to control me. Hell, you're, you're trying to track me. Uh, you're, you're putting little miniature chips in my body. And that was unheard of. And today it's like people are like, I don't want to be tracked. I don't want, to, I don't want the, the government to know where I am. Well, guess what? You have a cell phone. They know exactly where you are. <laughs> if they want to know where Joe Blow is or Darren Pfeiffer or Nick and Chris, you guys, we all have cell phones. They can track us every minute of the day. They can even listen to our conversations by tapping into our phone and turning it on if they really wanted to. And that's, that goes into a whole other issue of privacy, which I won't dwell on that for too, too long. But I don't give a fuck. You want to dive into my emails? Go at it. You want to listen to my phone calls? Knock yourself out. I have nothing to hide. I don't care about privacy. I have nothing to hide. I'm not a terrorist. I'm not committing crimes. I'm not a drug dealer or a pedophile or running a meth ring. Uh, and if it means that you tap into my phone just to make sure that I'm cool and you tap into a thousand other phones and you find that guy that's building a bomb that's going to explode in a mall that I'm going to be at, then I'm all for it. Yeah. Anyway, that's enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's let's move on to more positive things, I guess, really. Well, let's talk about music. Yeah. So I, I guess the way we do thing, these things, um, we generally kind of take it back a little bit, really. Um, really to the start, from I guess from a personal point of view, from your side like so you grew up in buffalo and kind of i i guess what was your your early kind of journey into music so really kind of going back if 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 that's cool that's why cool. i started playing drums when my mom uh, brought a snare drum into the family i was about seven and everyone was like you know just i've come from a family of five kids so we all were banging on it and beating on it and and then everyone kind of lost interest except me so I brought it into my room and I was tapping along to the radio when I heard a song, I, I realized, okay, I got, I can keep time with the right hand and play the snare drum with, with the, with the left. And, and I'm getting, I'm getting pretty good at this. And I, I just did, I wouldn't give up. And I started yeah. learning the rudiments and started learning how to play it properly and different sounds the drum makes and soft and hard. And then she's like, you want a drum set, don't you? And I got a drum set and I, I practiced to rock bands like Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath and, and uh, the clash and, Van Halen and even some Kiss songs, even though I'm not a fan. Uh, I just would play anything that, that would make me better. And I got really good. And then I joined a, a band in high school and it was heavy metal, hard rock. And, and that broke up. And that band actually reformed and became kind of a corpse. So I still stay in touch with those guys, the death metal guys. Oh, I was really, okay. into, I was really yeah, into that. Yeah, yeah. The band called Beyond Death. And then they broke up. And right after that, they reformed with a bunch of other guys and and started uh, Cannibal Corpse. Then I got into hardcore. I was in a band called Zero Tolerance, which made a little bit of noise on the East Coast of the U.S. back in the late 80s and early 90s. And we played some shows with Green Day and, mm -hmm. and Today and Sick of It All and Chrome And we did these great tours. But I realized Buffalo, the, the music scene in Buffalo was finite. It, it wasn't as big as I'd like, I'd like it to be. There was only so much room to grow and be recognized by labels in New York or UK or, or, or L.A. And I had a friend in Buffalo or LA. He's like, "Come yeah. on out, man! You're you're ripping good drummer. You gotta you gotta you gotta be where the action is." So at 23, I flew to Los Angeles in 1991, and never looked back. Uh, I I was like, love with the weather, love with the vibe, love with the culture, the politics. Obviously, there was bands everywhere and music venues everywhere and record labels back then. '91. We're, we're not shy in signing bands. It wasn't like it is now with streaming and downloads and, and internet wasn't what it is like we know today. So it, it, the music was, it was, was so, bustling, bustling. So 
uh, got into a scene, started playing with some cats, uh, started playing in a band with J- a guy named Jason Cropper, who was in Weezer right before they released their blue record. He got removed from the band. We started another band and I joined that. And um, then I met John Feldman. And that's another, that's another story. If you guys are keen on that. That would have been 1993, 94. It was 93. Yeah, 93, 94. When I when I met John, I was working at Starbucks in Los Angeles. I met his. Friend. Were you a manager of the Starbucks? At the I, time? Was. I, I, I was. I yeah, was a. I was an assistant manager of Starbucks. Yeah, I ran the store. I got there at six a.m. Actually, I got there at five to open the store at first six. I skateboarded to work. I skateboarded home. Yeah. Uh, it was a I, it was a job that I absolutely loved. I was bummed when I had to quit it because Goldfinger were doing so well. I was I was <laughs> upset. They're like, Darren, you got to quit your job, and we're gonna walk. I'm like, why? They're like, because you're gonna go on the road. Right. I'm like, oh, I love my job. They're like, do we want to be a Starbucks or do we want to be a band? <laughs> so it's kind of funny. I love the job. So I, I met this guy named Damien who was a surfer hippie guy, wore patchouli, and but he was just so cool. And we'd we hang out, listen to music, and smoke weed, and and talk about girls and music all day. And he told me about this guy named John. He was in this band called Electric Love Hogs. And they were signed to a label called London Records. And then they got dropped. And now John is kind of picking himself off the ground and trying to figure out what he wants to do next. So he'd come into Starbucks. And I he this is a great story, by the way. He introduced himself. Hi, I'm John. I'm friends with Damien. I go, I heard a lot about you. And he's like, he's like, yeah, you like punk rock? I'm like, of course. And he goes, cool, me too. And he goes, we start talking and he goes, Nirvana, you like Nirvana? I'm like, I love Nirvana. He goes, yeah, Nirvana are pretty badass. And he goes, what do you think of Dave Grohl's drumming? So I said, "I Dave Grohl's solid as a fucking rock. And, and he got kind of mad. He goes, Dave Grohl's the best rock drummer in the world right now. <laughs> All right. And I said, well, I don't know about that. I mean, there's a lot of other drummers that are probably better than Dave Grohl. And he got... <laughs> He got even just a little teensy bit more upset. He's like, so wait, you don't think Dave Grohl's good? I'm like, I'm not saying that. I'm saying he's really good, but he's not the best rock drummer in the world. There's, there's, there's way better rock drummers than Dave Grohl. He's like, well, I suppose you're better than Dave Grohl. Now, I'm not trying to say I'm, a, I, I'm the best drummer in the world, okay? I just want to preface what I'm about to say. But I think technically, chops-wise, speed-wise, uh, rudiment-wise, I'm probably a better drummer than Dave Grohl. <laughs> it doesn't matter. But at the time, I was like, "Yeah, I thought probably I'm probably better than Dave Grohl," and he just went off and was like, "You're, you're probably you're probably a piece of shit, and you can't play at all. You think you're hot shit. Who, who the fuck are you?" And this was on the first. This this was all on the first meeting. No, this is like three or four. Oh, he come in okay. okay. He come in a lot right. to get free coffee. See his friend Damien, and we talk music. And this one time, it got out of hand. So he left it in a huff, and I was like, "Your friend John's a dick." <laughs> he's like, "Oh, he's just really passionate about music." And, so he'd come in a few more times and, hey, Darren, hey, John, you know, just giving each other the eye. And then he, he decided to engage in me again with another conversation about metal. Now, as you know, I, I have a metal background. Yeah. And he goes, Darren, do you like uh, Pantera? Again, 1993, 94, Pantera are red hot. And he, I, I love Pantera. He's like, oh, you like metal? I'm like, of course. He's like, what do you think of Vinnie Paul, the drummer of Pantera? I'm like, Vinnie Paul's fucking wicked good. He's like, let me guess. You can play all that fast double bass shit. I go, actually, I can. <laughs> and he snaps and he goes, you must be the best drummer in Los Angeles. Why aren't I playing with you? I'm like, you're such a dick. <laughs> so then fast forward about two months, a demo tape falls into my friend Pete's lap. Now, Pete's another guy that works at Starbucks and he's a drummer. He was hippie. Yeah. And he goes, hey, uh, that John Feldman guy came in and gave me a tape. And it's not, it's not my speed. Now, I was a little offended. I was like, John knows I can play. Like, why didn't he give me the tape? Oh, he hates me. I hate him, too. So uh, it's probably more your speed, Darren. <laughs> so I took it home, and all it had on it was his name and his number, John Feldman and his phone number. So I took it home, and I this was cassettes, right? So took the five-song cassette home, popped it in, played it, was blown away. It wasn't here in your bedroom, but it had anxiety on it, and yeah. it had oh, – it, um, Miles Away, and some other songs that made the first record. Yeah, I was absolutely, unbelievably, unequivocally blown away. Floored. It was so good. I mean, fucking, I called him immediately. I, yeah. And I'll never forget the phone call, guys. He goes, yeah. I go, hey, John, it's Darren Pfeiffer. And he goes, what do you want? <laughs> so I said, 
Uh, okay, well, I got your tape from Pete, and I'm listening to it, and he goes, yeah, what do you think? I'm like, it's absolutely fucking amazing. He's like, and then he changed into the nicest, sweetest guy you'll ever meet in your life, and my best friend. And we did. We became we became best friends, and he he begged me to to uh, jam with him, and uh, reluctantly I did. I went to the rehearsal space. Uh, it, was, it was John Feldman, and it was Simon Williams, and another guy named Steve Geiger, but he was a no show most of the time because he was he had, he had uh, substance abuse problems. Uh, plus, he was run, running a jewelry business, so he was really busy. So it was one, just the three of us with no name. There was no, it wasn't called Goldfinger, just three cats in a room. Mm -hmm. I, I played a song. I played another song. I played another song, and John was practically begging me to join. He's like, I, we've had drummer after drummer after drummer come in here, and they think they're good, and they're not, and you actually are. And you learn the songs, like you learn the fills, and, the, and you learn them all, and you have to be in this band. And I was reluctant because I was like, this guy is the same guy. It was like such a dick to me. Now he's like my best friend, but, but the music was too powerful for me not to say no. I had to say yes. I go, yeah, yeah, this is what I want to do. And, and then we got rid of Steve because he just was unreliable and we brought in Charlie and then we were a band and then we were b bouncing around names and Goldfinger stuck. It wasn't supposed to be a full-time name, but it just stuck. And yeah. then the rest is history. But you, but you essentially fell in love with John's music than than more than you did with John at the film. Uh, John at the but start once there, once right? he realized that I could play and that I was a heavy hitter and I knew punk rock and I knew I knew I knew how to play his stuff well, he he changed his tune. He became my friend. He he realized that okay maybe this guy could play and maybe he isn't full of shit. And and then I realized well John's just an eclectic dude and. But wow, can that can that motherfucker write a song? And even though today we don't talk and we're not really allies anymore, yeah. uh, I will never throw the man under the bus for uh, his songwriting prowess. Right. The man is incredibly talented. He knows how to write music and write it well. It's just personally we don't see that eye. I mean, we've spoken to like a few people on on this podcast who've worked with them over the years, and. Um, and this, it's it's a similar similar situation in the sense that you know their relationship isn't quite what it used to be, and it's been a bit difficult. But there's still a huge amount of respect there in terms of um, you know his work as as an artist and as, as a writer and as. Oh a producer, yeah, I, I mean it's common sense. I mean I'm not going to bag on him for his musical ability. He's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant as a songwriter. Uh, it's just personally we don't we don't see eye to eye and it, it went he went one way i went another and we, we, we there was the, the communication wasn't there and if you want to know why i'm not in the band it's because the fun was gone uh, i got kicked out of that band four times and right the fourth time was it it should have been the third time it was, but the fourth time it was it i didn't want to go back i didn't want to fix it i didn't want to make amends i didn't want to uh, I got even asked, I was playing a show with the Dickies in California, no effects, punk and punk and drug, like beer that they released. And I was playing with the Dickies and Goldfinger was on the bill and me and John had a few pleasant words. And he asked me to come on stage and, and do a couple songs. I said, no. And he goes, why? And I'm like, eh, I'm not into it. Plus the Dodgers are playing in the world series. and I want to go watch that game. And he goes, you'd rather watch baseball <laughs> than play with Goldfinger. I'm like, yeah, I would. <laughs> So we're dri me and Stan Lee of the Dickies were driving back to watch the game. And he goes, why didn't you jump up there and play a couple songs? It would have been fun. And I'm like, well, it would have been fun, but I don't want to be a prop. I don't want to be something, you know, that helps John look like he's the nicest guy in the world. So plus it just would have felt, it would have felt weird. And the fun, long, long story short about me and Goldfinger, the, the fun was gone. Uh, when, when I got kicked out of the band that time, I, I didn't want to fix it. I didn't want to meet with him. I just wanted what was owed me. I wanted to be out of any contracts that could have brought me legal problems in the future. I wanted, I wanted, I just wanted to end it. I didn't want to fix it. The fun was gone. The fun was gone. The last year, two years of that band, it was, it wasn't fun. The rehearsals weren't yeah. fun. The shows weren't fun. The arguments before or after the show weren't fun. Being around him wasn't fun for me. I loved the high profileness. I loved the shows. I loved uh, the fans, but. I just, the stress level of being in that band, for me at least, was, was really high. 
I don't want to, um, obviously, we won't talk about this all night. Um, we'll move on at some point. But so if you don't mind, Darren, just a couple more questions on, on, on this subject. Um, like you mentioned, you mentioned like at the latter stages of the fun had gone, but I, I feel like I've heard you say, like when you were chatting to Tony Lovato, you you said how you, you guys used to refer to him as like the fun John. And like you, you, you were like saying almost like in the early 2000s, like the fun had gone for you like certainly with <laughs> interacting with Feldman so like was I guess like was this like an underlying thing for most of your career with Goldfinger or or did it only really come to the to the the front in the latter years no it kind of got worse and again I want to preface what I'm about to say with I wasn't a sweetheart either uh, I wasn't easy to be around or work with uh, neither, neither was Charlie and, you know, even Kelly and Simon had their flaws, just like everybody else. Uh, but I, I particularly was was problematic uh, at times. Um, I like to think, for the most part, I was easygoing and fun and, and wanted to have a good time. But I, I know I had my, I know I was a thorn in John's side and Charlie's side and vice versa. So, but as time went on, he became more and more involved in his production yeah. side of things. He wanted to find bands and work with labels and, and get the studio and that's what he should do because he's really really good at it uh but as he became more and more involved in production and songwriting goldfinger became less and less of, an, of a priority for him and that was how me and charlie and kelly made money right. from going on the road and playing and selling merch etc. so we were so the tensions kind of got were there and and he's like i'm doing this regardless of i don't need your authority i don't need your permission and we're like right but you know it's kind of a bummer you know and sometimes shows would be canceled because, like, full shows with real like, tours with real big fish would get canceled because John got a, a sweetheart production thing that fell on his lap, and it, it, the dates contradicted. So we were like, money got pulled out of our pockets for sure. Because so so he he, he changed. Uh, we yeah. all changed, and it is what it is. And I don't I don't hold any resentment towards him. If he called me, I would pick up the phone and have a conversation. But I, if he wanted me to come back in the band, it would be it would be hard. I'd be hard pressed to, to want to go back. Well, what what about the good years though? I mean, let's let's kind of switch back to that. And obviously, you you know you went from Starbucks manager, and you know you met John and started doing things, and that that what you know the success came pretty quickly, right? And what I mean, what were some of the the the, the moments whilst the, you know the good moments whilst things were at, a, at your height, and you were just actually becoming like quite a big want, thing that's and... a good point that's a really good point most of goldfinger again this is just my perspective but most of the time in goldfinger was good uh early on it was great in the middle it was great towards the end at least for me it was it was problematic um but but there were a ton a ton of good times a ton of laughs a ton of camaraderie and laughing and giggling and stupidness and silliness and brotherhood and and shows great shows great tours videos successes looking back what if you had to pick like some of the favorite tours what would they be we did a tour with no doubt right when tragic kingdom was blowing up and it was sold out yeah, venues yeah. of like 2000 to 3500 around there and every show was epic epic we also toured england are not in england we toured most of europe with a german old german punk band called die totenhosen uh, right. And we did a tour of all over Germany and part and parts of Italy and Austria and you know all over Europe, and those shows were huge, like eight thousand, ten thousand seaters. And they'd walk up on stage and introduce us as, "Hey, these are our friends." Of course, in German, these are our friends, Goldfinger. Please show them the respect. We love them. And those shows were just ridiculous. So probably the tour, we uh, no doubt in America, and then Die Totenhosen in Europe. Was there, was there a like defining define moment for you and and the guys of uh, you know in those early days of when you were like right this is this is it was there or was it just a, a kind of progressive organic kind of thing? Early on in our career, we played this radio festival in Washington D.C. called HF Festival. It was a radio station called WHF, and they would take over the football stadium there, the RFK Stadium football stadium, and do this gigantic radio festival every year. Uh, Foo Fighters yeah. were the headliner. Now, they were a, a new band, but they were still the Foo Fighters. And that record had hit after hit after hit. So they headlined, and then we went on after them. Now, 
We didn't go on. We didn't headline the festival. We were the closing band. We were told, you're the closing band. You're the band that everyone's going to leave the venue. And we were talking 85, 80,000 people uh, are going to be leaving the venue to us. Play. We didn't care. We're like, all right. I mean, we'll play to some. Some people will, will stay. And the guy's like, oh, yeah, some will stay, but most are going to make their way to the exits. And it was a great night. Thank you for coming, blah, blah, blah. We'll see you next year. So Foo Fighters go, and, and it's like 80,000 people screaming, jumping up yeah. and down. And, of course, the show is epic for them. We get on stage, and we're, and we're realizing no one's leaving. Everyone's still facing the stage. Lights are on. There's music. Uh, you know. And we start our show, and literally, I would say it's at least 70 of the 80,000 people stayed. Yep. And were decent. just as raucous for us as we were for the Foo Fighters. Right. And I, this is our first record. hasn't been out six months. <laughs> We're, we're still very green, we're still very young, and we're looking at each other on this massive stage when playing in front of like 70,000 people plus and looking at each other like, is this actually happening? Like, are, are, are these fans singing back our songs to us? Like, this is fucking ridiculous. Yeah. We walked off stage and it was like better than any drug or any alcohol you could take, any high you could imagine, euphoria. We walked off stage, the promoter of the thing was like, we, we didn't... We didn't expect people to stay. Last year, the Ramones were the closing band, and everyone left. Hmm. You guys, everyone stayed. We would, it was it was a moment we realized we're onto yeah, something. Yeah. I think. I was. I wanted to ask you before when when you taught uh, tour in Europe with that with that 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 sort of uh, legendary German band. Um, didn't you play with the Sex Pistols for a couple of shows around around? the sort of mid nineties. We did. We played with them on their filthy lucre reunion. Yeah, what, tour. what it was, Go us, on, sorry. It was us sex pistols and another band called gravity kills. And then when we went to South America, our um, New Zealand and Australia it was with a band called skunk and Anson. Yeah. Yeah. We know them. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah we're we a big played, British band. Yeah. We played all over the world, Japan. We went all over the world with this, with this band Europe. And we, I think we went to Europe. Maybe we didn't. Anyway, I don't remember. I don't remember. Anyway, we were miserable for the first three or four shows in the U.S. We hated. We hated. We hated it. Now, keep in mind, we're a bunch of young guys in our mid twenties, and the Sex Pistols are yeah. older, and their demographic is older. Uh, tickets for this concert were not in the price range that our yeah. demographic could afford. Yeah. Our, our fans didn't want to spend forty, fifty dollars, sixty dollars to see Goldfinger. And a band that they they've heard of but don't really know a yeah. lot about. So we had a lot of shows early on where people were arms were crossed, no one was right. moving. Imagine Goldfinger playing its music and everyone's staring at you, and they're all in their forties, fifties, and we even got some fingers. People with their finger up the whole time, like double fingers at us, like <laughs> you guys. So we would be backstage really bummed out, and then we realized we got to make this. We got to turn this around. Or we're gonna just we're gonna just die of depression. Let's have some fun with this. Let's take some shots at the audience. Let, let's turn this into a comedy routine. So we would go on stage. I think the fourth or fifth show, and we uh, we play three songs, and then we'd stop and we hear some boos and maybe a couple of polite claps. And we're like, look, we know you hate us. We, we we know you're not here to see a band called Goldfinger, and we appreciate that. But just know that you're all old and you're all gonna be dead soon, and we're just starting our lives. And then we play, and the boo fingers go up play two more songs and we'd stop and go oh one more thing uh we're all gonna have sex with your daughters <laughs> so if you brought if you brought your daughter they're going to get fucked and it's gonna happen just just accept it and then we and this next song so i'll hear you better the boo shit was thrown at us and we would just walk off stage laughing and pissing ourselves we thought we we're gonna get in trouble um from the pistols but we didn't every night we would just take shots at these people like you're all old and you'll be dead soon so Fuck you. You don't like us? Fuck you. How's that for punk? I guess it was the point where pistols weren't really that punk anymore, right? <laughs> no, they never actually were really punk at all, anyway. They, they were put together and yeah. stringed together by Malcolm McLaren. What about your time in the UK, UK Darren? I mean, obviously, you've you've got quite a pretty solid following over here. Uh, you know, what was your early experiences of the UK and how have you found, found that over the years? Every time we would go to the United Kingdom and play from the beginning of our career going to England to uh, towards towards the end of at least my career with the band, 
no matter if it was a festival like Reading or Leeds or, or Tea in the Park up north or, or, or anything in between or a, or a big or bigger size venue like the Storia when it was yeah. in London or Electric Ball you know, yeah. in Camden or, or, or you know, any, any Man- what's the one in Manchester? Manchester. Um, uh, it's just the Academy, isn't it? Academy. That's it. Yeah. yeah. We played a bunch of academies around the, the UK yeah. and the shows were always packed. They were always off the goddamn chain and the fans would stay and meet you at your bus and want to talk to you about stuff and sign autographs, and take pictures and, and give you demo tapes. And every, and the, it was just insane. It just absolutely insane. We used to love playing England because we knew it was going to be nuts. Knowledgeable fans, good people. Uh, great food, great vibes. Just we loved everything about it. So, so from you on a personal basis, you you moved to Toronto in two thousand and two, right? Um, what what kind of drove 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 that move? I moved to Toronto in two thousand and two. I got married to um, Goldfinger's publicist in Canada, a girl named right. Vicky. Oh, okay. And she moved to LA for a few years, and then we moved to Toronto, and I became a Canadian citizen. And I, growing up in Buffalo, I had a healthy respect for right, Canada. Right. And a healthy respect for Toronto. And she's like, do you want to live in Toronto? I'm like, absolutely. And the band at that point was successful enough. Where we never rehearsed really at all. Just unless it was time to record a record. Then we get together and knock out the tunes. But um, the band was like, yeah, dude, if you want to live in Toronto, go for it. And I loved Canada and everything about hockey culture and the beer and the music and the vibe. So I, I lived in Toronto for a number of years, started a record label, which I still run and own called High 4 mm-hmm. Recordings. And I'm actually putting out that the new Jason Cropper record on Monday, the 13th. Um, Jason from Weezer, Jason Cropper, new new music coming from him uh, called cool. Goodness Knows. So on Monday, go on your platforms and look for that. Jason Cropper, Goodness okay. Knows. Um, cool. So, so I, I, had, I had 10 solid years in, in Toronto, and, my divor- and I got a divorce. And I just missed being in L.A. too much. I missed my friends. I missed my band. I missed... Uh, the vibe, the scene, and, and at that time I was ready for a change uh, to to get back into the U.S. and get back into Los Angeles. So I moved here, uh, met this girl named Cheryl, who's a, a Brit. She's from Ipswich. Oh, really? Oh, okay. 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 Yeah, I know Ipswich. Yeah, go there sometimes. I was just, I was just there in January with a uh, visitor family, and so spent some time in Norwich and Ipswich and in right. the surrounding areas. And I loved it. Then spent. Beautiful coastline and some nice rural areas in East Anglia. Oh, it's really nice. And then we spent a day in London. The last day, we, Sunday, we went to London and kicked it around for a day. It was it was nice. really nice. So I, I married her a year ago okay. and got that's a house, nice building a studio in the, in the garage. And that's that's my personal life. Got a stepdaughter. So you're saying you're, uh, you were, you're thinking about doing some solo material, but you did a little bit of solo material, which is quite hard to find, actually. The Revenge of the Chicken McNuggets. Is that right? I, I've been writing songs. I mean, obviously, I wrote the Chicken McNuggets song that was on, um, I think it's on Hang Ups. Uh, and then I just started writing more stupid songs like that. And then it, I, one turned into like 10. And then someone's like, dude, just record them and put them out. It would be fun. You could sell them at the merch booth. And I did. And it sold well. <laughs> and then I did another, and then a second one called The Artist Formerly Known as Dangerous Darren. And those sold well too. And the songs weren't anything. I'm not John Feldman. I can't write a song, but I but I can string together some sounds to make it sound like I'm writing a song. <laughs> and uh, yes, I've been, I've been putting these other songs together. I got about 15 of them demoed that I put on an acoustic guitar and just would sing the melody. And, and again, they're all really dumb songs, stupid, silly song titles with silly little riffs and. And I, I've been, I got a studio I'm building, so I like, oh, I can just re- knock these out myself. Play the drums, lay down the bass, throw the guitars all over it, and then sing it poorly, and mix it and master it. And I got this, du- I got this uh, record label, digital worldwide distribution through Sony. And I can, I can put it out myself. I can promote it myself with my own money. And so I, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna, I'm in quarantine, right? I got nothing else to do. Yeah. Can't, yeah. can't do anything. Can't go to concerts, can't go to movies, can't really go out too, too much. So that's what I think I'm going to do. So, 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 what does kind of an average kind of week, obviously before the current shit that's going on at the moment, what does a kind of average week look like to you now? Then, obviously, you have got the label that's still ticking over. You have your studio. You obviously work with artists there, right? 
Uh, well, I do a lot of drum tracks for, for guys that send okay. me demos and I'll, I'll record something. I'm doing something right now with Greg Camp, who was in Smash Mouth for, forever. Oh, wow, okay. And he wrote all their hits. Greg Camp, yeah. yeah. So he sent me this really awesome song that uh, it's like reggae, not ska, but it's like Hepcat. It's just so fucking good. Mm. Okay. And I, I told him, I go, not only do I want to play drums on this, I want to put it out. He's like, oh, yeah, we, we can do that. I'm like, dude, it's really, really, really good. Like, it's going to get noticed. It's going to get some attention. because, goes, oh, that's why I want you on it. So, like, I, I play on these guys' records. I, I'm not really working with too many bands because you can't these days. You can't bring five guys into a room, and that's not really – that's kind of frowned upon. Um, so so my, my typical day is I'll wake up, and I'll, I'll, I'll do a little work on my label, uh, work on what I'm releasing next, which is that Jason Cropper song a song called Goodness Knows. So I'll deal with the people at Sony to try to find ways to, to promote it better when it comes out or when it's out, when it's when not actually out in the world breathing. I want to find, I want to get as many eyes and ears on it. Um, and there's licensing and sync. I'm talking to music supervisors from TV shows and movies and video games to, to maybe look at some of the bands I have on my roster uh, and Jason Cropper's new music and see if it's a fit in anything that they're working on. Yeah. Um, so who else? Who else have you got then to, to shout out about on uh, on your label at the moment? Uh, just go to high4recordings.com. There's a bunch of bands. There's a band called Crush Luther, which was a like a Maroon Five Canadian yeah, type of thing. Yeah, yeah, I know them. A band called Cauterize, which was uh, really big. They were on Wind Up Records and did a bunch of tours. They're like they're hard rock. They're like kind of emo hard rock. Yeah. Well, I feel like uh, they broke up. They were kind of like part of that treble charger sort of Canadian pop punk sound um exactly exactly yeah and i got a really great punk band that i i put out quietly called the black rainbows out of toronto and i was in the process of shopping them well at first i put it up i put it out soft release didn't tell anybody and then i was going to take that and shop it around the labels in you know new york and la and london and, and try to find them a real label a real yeah, home yeah and then you know i'll take take part of the proceeds but then COVID hit, and that's on hold. And another girl named Rochelle Harrison with a great song um, that I wanted to do the same thing with her. She's more country pop. Nice. So I wanted to put, I wanted to, to do the same with her, but that's on hold. Okay. I have a country Americana guy named Ryan Sims that's doing really well. Uh, coming up with some new music from him in the next week or two. So I, I have a, a number of releases that keep, that keep, that keep me busy from going insane and then yeah. you know spending time with my with my family spending time with my dogs uh working out you know jogging skateboarding i can't play hockey because there's no ice so i can't can't <laughs> skate can't play hockey um but just trying to stay active and, and stay busy and and hopefully the scientists of the world and the doctors of the world will figure out what's going on and we can we can slowly get back to normal. Yeah, fingers crossed for that. Uh, I suppose you've also got your Adobe show. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, that's something I, I started uh, as a gag. Uh, I was trying to get on air in, in uh, right. Los Angeles. I'm trying to find a radio job in L.A., and it's really hard. It's a tough, tough, tough market to crack into if you want to be a radio DJ. Yeah, yeah. So I got a job at iHeartMedia. And I was a producer. I was producing these other people and board hopping and putting them on air and fixing, fixing audio. And, and, and it was fine. It was, it was a job, but I want, it was, I thought it was a foot in the door to eventually morph towards being an on air DJ at this gigantic radio station. But the guy just refused to put me on air for, you know, for really? whatever reason. He just, even though I have like 10 years of experience on air at Toronto. Yeah. Right. Of uh, at the biggest station in Canada. Uh, uh, he didn't care. He just, he just didn't want me on air. Uh, so I, I left that job, and then I was like, I'm just going to start my own podcast. I think I have enough fans with Goldfinger and enough people. I know enough cool people and bands and, and enough celebrities where I can make a show like out of it. And it morphed into what it is today. And now I have like three dozen sponsors that come in and out. I got a bunch of soft sponsors that give me shit as long as I mention it on air. I got, um, I generate income from it. I, I got money coming in. It's not a lot, but it's, but it's, it's, it's free money as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I'm talking into a microphone with my friend TS and we're shooting cool. the shit and telling stories and having a few drinks and a few laughs. Next thing you know, a check shows up in the mail. It's, it's ridiculous. And now I'm at the point the show is doing so well 
and I got a few hundred thousand people listening at any given time, uh, including live when it goes live and then the downloads all yeah, together. Fun. But I have, I have Westwood One sniffing around. I have Sirius XM sniffing around, um, maybe wanting to, to, to bring it up a level to, to, to that. Right. So I'm, wow. I'm kind of nursing that. I'm kind of staying in contact with the Westwood One folks and staying in contact with Sirius folks and, and trying to find a way to make it work. Uh, we were actually in negotiations with Sirius when COVID hit. Uh, um, okay. We were talking about timing. Uh, we were talking about when it's going to be, when it's going to air. We're going to do it once a week, twice, twice a month. How's the act? Are you going to start over fresh with your guests and bring them on to Sirius? It's good to start fresh because I have a few hundred guests I've had on. Some wow. of them are very high profile, and and we were talking about money too, like how do I, how do I want to get paid? And then COVID goes bananas, and then that, that got put on hold. But I'm still talking to them. I'm still staying in contact, and, and I'm hoping that that they just go, all, right, Darren, all right, Darren, let's do it. Let's let's put it on serious. Yeah, I you suppose know. it's something you can still work out, right? Like regardless of what's going on right now, to a degree, it's. You know, well, I got my own. I got my own studio, so I can like to get them in and record the show. It's all it's all templated, so it's all ready to go. So all all all, all I need to do is just get the audio. I get the audio. I put it in. I don't have to tweak it. I don't have to EQ it. I don't have to compress it. I, do, I just press record, press stop record, and it's done. It's just nice. so easy. Yeah. The hardest part is getting guests, getting guests to confirm right. with times, yeah. Yeah. Like, like me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, getting, getting people to, to commit to a certain time. And, and, yeah, and it, we get that. It, ha- it does happen. Some people will tell me I'll be there on that day, and they are. Others are. Who's the favorite? Who's the favorite guest you've had so far? The best chat or the best? Uh, you know, if you could, if if you uh, kind of get anyone who was new to Dangerous Darren um, show, like what what episode would you tell them to go and listen to? There's a few episodes where I had Tony Hawk on. Oh, nice! Yeah. From the pro skater thing we did with, with Superman and the new one that's coming out right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, cool. So he, he was thrilled to have me down in his studios in, in uh, near San Diego. We did some skating with him, and then he came on the show, and we talked for two hours. And, and he was just such a nice guy. He knew a lot about music, a lot about pop culture. Obviously, we talked about skateboarding. And we talked about Goldfinger and how he really, really, really wanted us on that soundtrack. And, yeah. And how he was just a gigantic fan of the band. And he's, he's stoked that that song, Superman, kind of – emulates the soundtrack. Like, right. There's a lot of great bands on it. Yeah. No doubt. Dead Kennedys, I think Pennywise, Circle Jerks, but but the one band people talk about and the one song when they think about Tony Hawk Pro Skater is Superman. Yeah. What what about what about the new what about the new remaster versions coming out? Is there gonna be a place for uh, Superman there, do you reckon? Yeah it'll be on it. It'll be on it's a remastered nice. version of the song and we'll, it'll be on it. And all the same terms apply as far as sales and and royalties and i talked to tony he's going to send me a copy of the game when it's ready to go oh, uh, nice. and he's going to come back on the show again so I- i'm excited to Sweet. have tony hawk as a friend i've had i've had countless hockey players on i've had bmxers other skateboarders like caballero and uh, um mike mcgill came on these, these are bones brigades guys tony magnuson came on uh, yeah. uh, high profile actors like Kiefer sutherland came on talked about oh, wow his, uh, his uh, country career. I- I've had some really funny, great, some great guests. Dexter from Offspring was on. Yeah. So how do you go about, how do you, obviously are you saying, you know, Kiefer Sutherland and how do you, and, and the difficulties you have, like kind of arranging guests as, as we do, but we're quite, I, I, I guess we, we kind of focus on music and the alt scene and stuff like that and just go after kind of Instagram accounts. I mean, how do you, how do you go about capturing and uh, locking down those those guys like in, from all different walks of life, I guess. There's a couple different techniques I use. One is going through the proper channels, which is their manager or their PR, but that course, can be a yeah. pain in the ass. Yeah. Uh, and it's really easy, but for the most part, they're, they deflect and they deflect and they deflect. I'm trying to get, yeah. I'm trying to get Dave Grohl for it. Oh, and really? Dave Grohl's yeah. people deflect. Right. And they deflect and they deflect. But I know for a fact, if I ran into Dave Grohl, he would a remember who I am, yeah, because he's that guy. And if I said, Dave, can I get your number? And I really want to have you on my podcast. It, we'll have a really fun chat. We'll talk drums. We'll talk punk rock. Can we do it? He'd be like, Dude, absolutely. Here's my number. Let's do it. Yeah. But you know, when you're dealing with the manager and the PR people, it, it tends to be problematic. Yeah. Well, the other way I do it is I, I straight up stalk them 
just on Facebook, <laughs> on Instagram. I'll send, uh, for example, Tony Hawk took me some time. I had to send him right. 16 or 17 <laughs> messages until he finally replied. Uh, uh, here's another one. Um, Tony, our, um, what's his name? Tommy Lee, drummer from Motley Yeah, Crew. yeah, yeah. I've sent 30 or 35 messages, and he just replied to me last week. <laughs> I, so he's, he's, he's an upcoming guest. Is that, is that, is that what you're revealing yeah, right now? I'm going to get him on in the next, in the next, in the next few weeks. He, he know we've run into each other a few times. He knows who I am. Um, Stacy Peralta, the guy who started Paul Peralta skateboards. I yeah. sent him numerous. Yeah. Uh, Christian Hastoy, who's a well-known skate skateboarder. He finally replied, uh, believe it or not, this is weird. It's not really pop culture or, or extreme sports, but Cato Kalen, who was a, uh, roommate of oj simpsons during the trial wow he, he lived in the guest house kato kalen and if you know who he is or not he was like a surfer guy and he was he gave some testimony during the trial and he was he's kind of a kind of a clown but uh he said yeah i'll come on your show fuck it as everyone know, if you're in america you know who kato kalen is so it's just it's just straight up stalking and being polite and and when you yeah. are stalking just be hey i don't mean to bother you but I got this podcast. I'm not sure if you're checking these messages. I'd really like to have you on a fun little chat. We'll talk. And then yeah. if they're a skateboarder, I'm like, we'll talk about skateboarding. If they're a guy in a band, I'm like, hey, we'll talk about yeah. punk rock. Yeah. If they're, you know, I've, I've had, uh, oh, it's just, it, it's a pain in the ass. But I know enough people. And, and or, or Foxy by Proxy, which is a term like, if I want to get to that guy, I got to go through this guy, right. that right. girl, and yeah, that yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah. Well, but that's a harder route to take, but it has worked. It's it's always worth doing, but yeah, I think we I think uh, Nick Nick and I can relate to to all of those techniques. The amount of people that yeah, there's no there's clearly stuff. no secret for there's no clearly no secret formula. No. It is a, a mixture of just just try it, try and whatever you can. Right? Yeah, and yeah. Just and just being, be being persistent, you got to be persistent, but be persistent and polite. Yeah, yeah. You know, just be like, hey, I'm really sorry to bother you again, but I really got this got this show, I got this podcast, I'd love to have you on. And then if I, like, for example, I've had Chris DeMakes on from, from Less Than Jay. Yeah, right, right. And I, I, know that he, I know that he knows a few people, so I made a list. I'm like, hey, Chris, can you get me in touch with blah, 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 this guy and that guy? Yeah, like, Dude, yeah. totally. Here's his number. And then I'll reach out to them. They're like, oh, yeah, I know, Chris. I know you. You want to be? On, you want me to be on your show? Done. <laughs> so there's, there's no tried and true way. There's a lot of, a lot of there's different There's no techniques. secret formula. There's a lot of different yeah. techniques. I know I've had a really good uh, good chat, Darren. I really appreciate your time. Don't want to take too much of your time. On, I'll say on a Friday night. It'll be Friday morning for you right now, right? Um, uh, yeah, Friday. Oh, what's the noon now? You guys are on, what, 8 o'clock? Eight, eight, yeah, eight, just coming up to 8. Yeah. Up, uh, yeah. Uh, so, so I, I still got to record some drums today. Um, I have to – what else do I have to do? I got to do some work for that Jason Cropper release, which is Monday. Right. So I got. I want to make sure that I haven't missed anything as far as press releases and, and social media push and and the PR guy that I, that I hired to 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 get the word out press wise. But everything I'm doing is revolved around music, like the the Dangerous Darren Show podcast. People can go find that online or yeah. at Dangerous D underscore Show Twitter Instagram. You can follow us. Now that's a lot of fun when I do that. I mean, playing a punk rock karaoke whenever we get around to playing again is just an absolute blast for me because yeah, I'm in a yeah, band yeah. with my dear friend forever and there is zero zero drama okay now everybody that's in a band or that's a, whether it's professional or, or not can tell you it's hard it's hard being a band with with other people oh yeah and, with egos and and people have issues and there's fights and breakups and it's hard it really is difficult at times to be in a band but not this band punk rock karaoke we're all brothers we all we all take the piss out of each other. We all have a great time when we play and a laugh and we make money. It's just a dream. It's a dream band. So between that and everything else I'm involved in, I, I think I have enough to keep me, um, keep me busy and out of jail. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Well, I hope to see uh, punk got karaoke over in the UK at some point. That'll be, yeah, uh, that'd be quite easy. Yeah. We were actually talking in November and December of 2019. We were talking to a few guys in the UK that were putting really? together some upstart festivals. One guy was in Manchester, one guy was in London, and there was another guy in Birmingham that I didn't talk to him. Um, but I talked to the other two guys, and they, they they had some capital. They had guy they had a guy that wanted to build this punk rock festival, and they knew they were going to lose money in the first year. Yeah. They knew they were going to lose money probably in the second. 
But like anything else, it, you got to build it up. Right. Warped Tour didn't make money until four or five years. Uh, mm -hmm. Coachella in here in LA yeah. didn't make money right away, and then now now it's a cash cow. Of course. Uh, so they were, they had the same philosophy that a couple of guys that wanted to bring some bands over and they wanted punk rock karaoke to close it, like we do with punk rock bowling every year in uh, Las Vegas. Okay. We're the last band yeah, of yeah. doing that for five oh, years. Oh. We're the last band. Everybody converges on this venue in Vegas. And we play for two two hours, two plus hours, because everybody is there and everyone's drunk and everyone wants to sing. And a lot of times we'll get like Jim from Pennywise will jump up or Fat Michael jump up or <laughs> it's just a complete anarchy. Show. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of the same philosophy. But then then a COVID hit and that whole that whole thing died on the vine. So we are hoping that this thing passes and we can call those guys up again and say, Hey, let's let's get this going. Let's get to the UK. Mm -hmm. Cool, we'll keep up. Keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, when it happens, uh, you'll hear about it. Cool. Well, thanks for your time, Darren. We'll let you get back to the start of your weekend, I guess. Awesome, but, Nick. Yeah. Thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. And whenever it is ready to go out into the world, just let me know with the socials and any kind of advertising material that you make. Uh, just let me know how I can get the word out and I'll, I'll help you out. Thank you so much. Awesome. Appreciate thanks it, man. So much, man. Yeah, you stay safe, man. All right, guys. Be well. Cheers, Darren. Yeah, and you, man. Cheers. All right. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, we'd love it if you could subscribe to us uh, wherever you get your podcast, whether that's iTunes or Spotify or Stitcher or any, anywhere like that. Um, also, check us out on social media. If, if you just search for Wasting Time Podcast on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, give us a like or a follow on any of those. And also, we love hearing from listeners as well. So uh, feel free anytime to drop us an email at the Wasting Time Podcast at gmail.com or obviously you can message us on social media as well but um yeah we'll catch you next time for you to arrive and i'll